So um, it, it, at the moment, it really doesn't matter where people are sitting. Uh, and they, uh, as the day goes on, people will shuffle you. So if you sat where the number one matches what's on your table, then uh, you won't have to move the first time we go around. And the, the reason that we have the numbers on this table is ideally, as the day goes, you'll get to interact with different people every time we rotate. And you'll have a mix of students and parents and community members and uh, select people and police officers and the fire department and uh, different community organizations will be. You'll have that mix at any given table. So that's that's how today's set up. So uh, I, uh, Scott Parker, I'm the superintendent here at uh, Monterey, and I would like to just turn things over briefly. To Dr. Richardson, our school committee chair. On behalf of the one on the school committee, I welcome you to this day long strategic planning session. Thank you for your interest, time, and especially your input in looking towards the future. Know the best reason of all for being here is in strategic planning comes back to every great school's number one priority, its students. Again, thank you for giving up a precious Saturday and being part of this collaborative effort. So I just want to spend a few moments to just talk about you know, why, we're, why we're here today. So, the key of today is we want to we want to gather community input to set the stage for a new strategic plan. But ultimately, that, that strategic plan is something we want to focus on. How can we ensure teaching and learning in our schools? So the one thing I want to sort of emphasize is this is really about supporting our students. So I know we have a number of students here from both the high school and the middle school, so could you stand up for a quick second? Thank you. So, the way I look at it is now that I've embarrassed you, um, my role as a parent, I just get it, is A, to be the superintendent, and B, to embarrass my children. I uh, have the opportunity I get. So, so, uh, up here are uh, Rory and Darby. Uh, uh, on, the, on the right are Rory and Darby, first day of school when they headed off this year to Montmoy Regional High School. So Rory's a junior, Darby is a freshman here. Uh, the picture on the left is what I put my four children through begrudgingly every year since they started in school. Uh, there's Rory's main tag hanging off of him when he was on his heading off to the first day of kindergarten, uh, saying that he needs to go and uh, head to Miss Demers' uh, kindergarten class. And you know, for me as a parent, looking back at this, I have to say, you know, and you know, this is an eleven-year span, or the span between Darby and her brother up there is a thirteen-year span. Those, that thirteen-year span is the length of time that we have your children with us at Montauk Regional Schools. And uh, looking back at my last 13 years with them, I mean, a lot's changed for them, for me, and our society. And I think part of today is sort of looking forward and thinking, how are things gonna be changing over the next 10, 13 years in our world? And what do we need our schools to be changing to, uh, to meet the needs of the students that are here today and the students that are yet to come. So, I've introduced myself. What I'd like to do as quickly as we can is just allow each of you to briefly go and say who you are uh, and, uh, and, and why you're here or who you, you know, I think many of you uh, they represent an organization, but, but just to get a sense of who's in the room. So we'll start over here with uh, Ms. Richardson. Joe Richardson, um, Montgomery uh, Middle School staff. Scary Couch, who's freaking representing 
Barbara Turkle, Great Union Town Elementary School. Ms. McGuire, Director of Student Services. Commissioner Clark, Town Administrator, and soon to be resident of Harbridge. Phil Massey, School Resource Officer for Ronroy Middle School and Chatham Elementary School, representing Chatham Police, and also a parent of two at Chatham Elementary School. Nancy Finn, Director of the Chatham Council on Aging, and also a parent of two children at Ronroy Elementary School. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. I'm Janet Boudreau, President of the Dennis Howard's Lighting Club, and we offer many programs for the children in the Dennis and Howard's, including scholarships speech contests and peace poster contests and many more activities for the community. So we're here to find out more about how we can help the community and the students grow. Thank you. Larry Gallagher and Ms. Mike Flynn in Harvard. I'm Deborah Bethart. I'm here today representing St. Christopher's in Chatham. I'm the youth director there. But I also have two children at Chatham Elementary, one at the, at the Rocky Uniform, and I have a wonderful cousin who teaches me. I'm Tina Gaines, a um, parent of two children. One is a junior at the high school, and the other graduate. Uh, 2017 Monterey graduate. I'm also here in the capacity as the chair of the Harwich Cultural Council. Um, I have a story. I have a child at Chatham Elementary and I am here at Chatham Elementary School. <coughs> Hi, my name is Anna Murphy. I'm a children of the district and I'm interested in participating in this as soon as possible. Kathy Bennett, I'm going to walk here. I'm going to walk out here. Steve Keenan, I'm the uh, president of the Friends of Bonnet or Wildlife Refuge. Ashley Gordon, I'm 
morning. I'm Dean Tripp, and I am co-president of my Hawaii Dollars for Scholars and a former employee of John High School. Hi, I'm Angie Chilaka. I'm a retired teacher, and I'm representing two groups of representing our students fund and the Cape Verde Multicultural Association.
McCoy was the first Asian American prom queen or homecoming queen at Chatham High School. And she just had her own baby girl, so it is our continue. So thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Matt Moshe, I'm the assistant principal at Monterey Middle School, and I heard there was food here. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Mark Wilson with the Monroe Middle School. I'm representing the 463 students who walk through the door every day from 10 different towns on Cape Cod and the 80 staff members who also serve as teachers. Hello, I'm Sarah Crisco. I'm the Science Program Director at Pleasant Bay Voting, Voting, Marine Science, and uh, Environmental Stewardship and Affordable, available in the Good morning, my name is Sarah Crisco. Good morning, my name is Steve Hogan. I'm a resident of Harvard. Graduate from Cape Cod Tech, many years ago. I work for Coast Tech and Optics, and I'm a Coast Tech leader, and I think that's why I'm going to get the board of education. Good morning, I'm Jill Bolton, Chatham resident and Chatham Foundation. Good morning, I'm Cecile Moranis, co-chair of the Academy of Schools. I'm Colleen Amelia Perez, and I'm a student at Monterey Regional Middle School. I'm Edwin Robinson, I'm the Minister of the Unitarian University Community House in Chatham. I'm here to listen and see if there's any way in which our uh, religious organization can give service to the children of Chatham College. Hello, I'm Liz Schell, and I'm with Earth Wedding Chatham Garden Club. Morning, I'm John Sinopoli, active Cape educator. Today, representing Friends of Pleasant Bay, in many ways, we promote education on the Cape, directly related to that thing, the important thing. Good morning, everybody. I'm Terry Russell. Thank you all for coming. Um, father of two graduates from college schools and a grandparent of two. Grandsons who are here at the high school are retired educator. Uh, good morning, my name is Cindy Stead. I'm on the Board of Health Services and I'm a trustee of Berkeley School for Blind. I too am here with the uh, uh, Harwich Chat Alliance. We are lucky enough to have team jackets. Uh, we would, our motto as Alliance is we serve, and that's something that we'd like to have to pass on and most of here. Good morning, everyone. Bill Burkett, Principal of Monterey Regional High School. Good morning, I'm Mark Smith, uh, Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment here at Longmont Regional Schools. Hi, I'm Ryan Doak, and I'm a student at Longmont Middle School. I am Bobby Bracken, a detective science from Howard Police Department, and uh, father of two students here at the high school, and uh, represent the Howard Police Department as well as the uh, Howard Police Soccer. Good morning, I'm Dave Clement, Chief of Police, Howard. Good morning, Justice Bono, I have uh, two students at Howard Elementary, uh, representing the our Germany School Council, the District Crisis Team, and the Public Tent of the Chess Fire. Good morning, I'm Jim Butter from the Blue Institute at King Crowd. We're located at the Howard Cultural Center. We've been programming on Clean Water. And I'm also a very proud mom of two students here at the high school, Marcus and Tom Wall. And I also serve on the Housing Authority here in Harwich and I'm a public bar commissioner here in Harwich. <coughs> Good morning. My name is Margaret Tripp. I'm an educator. I uh, taught grades one, two, three, and five, and held two elementary principalships. And I'm very pleased to be here today. Good morning. My name is Ian Smith. I am a captain of the Harvard Fire Department. I'm a resident of Harvard, a graduate of Harvard School, and I was soon to have a child with me. So thank you all for coming today. Um, as I said, today is really to focus on developing a new strategic plan for the school district. Uh, when I first came here, this is the start of my sixth year, there was a strategic plan in place, or at least that's what we sort of looked at it, but it was, it was more of a, a to-do list of things that had to get done really fast. You know, we needed to, Align the curriculum from Harvard Public Schools and Chatham Public Schools. Uh, 
go and develop two new middle schools, or a new middle school from two middle schools, and a new high school from two high schools, close down two buildings, move and make sure everybody's happy. And uh, it, you know, it, I just kind of looked at, if I you know, kind of think back on those first couple of years, it was, it was sort of survival mode that we were in, and it wasn't really a time that we could sit back and think about how do we improve the curriculum? What do we need to move forward? It was more of like, okay, here are the things that we need to get done, and uh, we have to get them done pretty fast. Um, we, we launched in 2015, uh, with a strategic plan, uh, we first developed uh, a, a vision statement for the school district uh, that says Bonneville Regional School Districts and Community Learners of all ages, focused on building knowledge, positive character, and resiliency in a safe, supportive, and creative, challenging environment. And we had four objectives in that first strategic plan that we've been following for the past three years. They were to develop an engaging, appropriately challenging, and interdisciplinary curriculum, to strengthen parent and community partnerships in support of student learning, to support learners of all ages in a safe and supportive environment, and to create an inspiring, positive culture that promotes and celebrates achievement. And if we look back over the last three years, there's a lot of great things that have happened. There's still some challenges we have, and you'll hear in a few minutes on each of the building principles as they reflect back on where we are after uh, over the, this course of the last three years and where we are sort of set to go. In terms of that strategic plan, there were a number of different initiatives that have taken place. Uh, everything from uh, math and focus uh, curriculum, uh, changing the math curriculum, kindergarten through grades through grade seven, uh, introducing physics first at the high school, also a ninth grade physics class to, uh, to a lot of social emotional learning initiatives. So you'll hear a number of these different uh, different things that have happened over the last several years. And one of the things I want to emphasize is that is that these aren't things that the administrators have done or that the superintendent has done or the school committees. These are things that our teachers have done. I mean, our teachers have really done some incredible heavy lifting over the last three years and have helped really propel this district forward. So in terms of the next strategic plan and, and why we're here today, today's really about the big picture. You know, I'll share some data, the principals will share some data, but you know, but our, our goal today is not to sort of dive down and try to dissect and and get into the minutia is to kind of take a big picture overview of our schools. It's also a, a chance to, you know, to think and, and do some forward thinking about where we want to see things. See things. This is a chance for me, my administrative team, and the school committee to listen to our community members and a broad range of people to hear what you're thinking about for our schools. So today is, is much more about us listening and getting your input and your creativity. Um, as, I, as I emphasized before, today is about improving teaching and learning here for all students. Uh, what we will be doing uh, as we move forward, we will uh, be taking a subset of people, uh, I've talked about the school committee meetings about having a, a steering committee that will take the input from today to help us develop the strategic plan that we will uh, put in place and present to the school committee in November. So there'll be some heavy lifting that happens with the feedback we get today as we develop that new plan to help guide us for the next three to five years. So that's a little bit about our day. I want to um, briefly introduce our facilitator uh, who's, uh, who's uh, will join us here from the back of the room. So I want to just uh, Introduce uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Patty Gavir. Uh, Patty is the former superintendent of Orange School Public Schools, and uh, she uh, is a former resident of Palm Beach. Knows uh, uh, knows uh, our our students and our uh, community well, and I uh, I really uh, see Patty as uh, someone who I can turn to for some great advice. And I've also seen her run some uh, pretty big meetings pretty well, so uh, I think she's great. Sometimes people think in, on the cake that where we 
come from uh, where we were defines us. But what defines educators is kids. So I retired seven years ago. Um, however, I've been doing professional development and consulting for 20 years. And I just can't seem to give up my passion for kids and teaching and learning. So I continue the journey like so many retired educators, formerly retired, and then we just keep working at this. So it is my pleasure to work with you this morning. Um, I'm going to be the taskmaster of the day. Everyone else gets to be uh, really engaging, and I get to be the taskmaster. Because we need to accomplish an awful lot in a short time. And what we want is to get your voices captured, organized, and heard, and then translated back to the school district so that they can use your, your words, your thoughts, your ideas, your creativity. So, um, it's my understanding that you're, Scott, you're going to present um, sort of the state of the school right now and then the administrators to follow, and then I'll re engage with you after that. So, as Pat said, I will just do a quick overview looking back over the last five years and uh, hopefully giving you a little bit of background information. Particularly for those of you who may have last tuned in when we had a regionalization vote, you know, here's, here's where we've gotten since. If, uh, if you were here three years or, or five years ago when I first landed at Monomoy, any presentation before the selectmen or, or at, uh, at Chatham or Harwich. I would talk about uh, something I saw as the promise of Monopoly. And that was that, that we would be able to pull, at the time, Chatham Public and Harwich Public together to improve the curricula, to expand opportunities, to enhance educational experiences for our children, and ultimately do this for less money than what it cost the towns to run their schools by themselves. So, if we look at some of the things that have changed in our curriculum over that period of time, we have uh, uh, a new science curriculum that we focus on at the eighth grade right, that incorporates oceanography themes into that entire curriculum. We've got a, a really well articulated social emotional uh, uh, curriculum throughout uh, the grade levels. Our elementary schools are starting to uh, develop what's called maker spaces, trying to focus on some engineering components there. Uh, we've got management at, uh, at, at the high school. Um, we've got uh, our, we have a student here videotaping today's presentation to be broadcast. We've got a, a great video production program that's happening at the high school. Um, we've got uh, uh, high tech things that our middle schoolers are doing. So there's there's improvements that have happened across the, across the grade levels. One of the big focuses of my team has been this, this sort of concept of we want to make sure that our students are achieving one year's growth and one year's time. Ideally, we want to see them growing even more than one year in one time. If, if, you, think about, if, if you think about that, it's, it's one year's educational growth. And if we look back at this, when we were Harwich and Chatham schools, this is back to 2011, is the left side. Everywhere up there are the grade level tests and uh, uh, in math and in English, and everywhere that's red is where our kids were growing less than the state average. And so on the right hand side is where Monopoly has been for the last two years in terms of where growth has been less than the state average. So we've made, we've made some significant headway. There's still work for improvement. There's still areas that we have kids not growing more than the state average. But at least when we look at growth from fourth grade through eighth grade, that's above the state average. And when we look at growth from from fourth grade all the way through tenth grade, that's now above the state average. And that holds true if we look at the 2012 date as well. So, so our kids are 
making more academic growth over a year's time. That's a good thing. What I've been stressing to folks this past year is that, is that we need to stop looking at the state average as our goal. You know, it's like we want to see our kids achieving something higher, much higher than that, you know, than that state average. And if we just look at, at average as the bar, and we're not going to go and see our schools being the best that they can be for our, for our students. So if we kind of look at just learning outcome data, we can say, okay, there's been quick improvement there. But one of the other neat things is to just look back at our schools over the last five years, and just in terms of what sort of different opportunities regionalization has brought. I mean, there's different sports that kids are playing, more sports. I mean, it's, it's, it's neat at the, at the middle school to, uh, you, know, when, you know, when one of the biggest challenges at the beginning of every school year is the principal coming to you saying, hey, could I get another you know, after school person to coach this or to run this club? Because if you've got kids running laps around or you have a track team at the middle school with you know, lacrosse you know, clubs and and it's been, you know, it's been neat to see all the different things that are happening on the athletic front. Uh, there's great new things that are happening in terms of the educational program on the academic front. Uh, I had a wonderful opportunity to join uh, middle schoolers as they went on a trip to Cuttyhunk Island following this uh, the book, you know, Beyond the, uh, was the Young Bright Sea book that they were reading last year. Uh, and you know, so it's just different curricular opportunities. There's a wonderful school culture that's developed in, in, in both the new high school and middle school, and just still wonderful cultures that we have at, at our elementary school. So it's a, it's a neat thing that's, you know, that's happening. Uh, the other thing that's, that's really refreshing to see is the outcomes at the end of this cycle are also starting to uh, head in really positive directions. Just to look at where our kids are getting into colleges and where they're heading off to now. Um, every year it's, it's just sort of a, 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 a sort of brighter future for our students. And part of that is because of the curriculum that's been put in place. Um, if you were at Harvard Public Schools or Chatham Public Schools, there weren't a lot of AP classes that you could take. And our students who wanted to head off to prestigious schools didn't have as many opportunities to go and demonstrate to colleges how ready they are for really rigorous work. We've got a robust AP program here. We've got a robust honors program that starts, that starts in the eighth grade that's really helping us launch kids into some really fabulous colleges. And then, I, I know that if I don't want to bring this up, Larry will be uh, going to say, hey, Scott, what's the bottom line? Uh, so so when, it comes to, when it comes to the bottom line, uh, if we look back at, in FY11, what the assessment was to our two towns, and, and, and where it is today, uh, the reality is that our budget for this current fiscal year, uh, FY19, for the taxpayers in Chatham, that bill that we will be assessing Chatham is actually almost $900,000 less than what Chatham was spending in 2011 to run the schools. In Harwich, in Harwich it's it's $5 million more, and we can talk a long time about, about the difference in, in, in how, that, how, that swing, how that swing happens, but there's actually, there's actually a financial benefit there that's happened on the park side, the side that I'll, uh, I'll get to in a second. The other thing that's important to note, if you look at the total assessment in terms of what that assessment is combined for Harwich and Chatham, and how much that's increased, if we were to increase that assessment by by two percent by two percent per year, um, we're you know, or, you know we well, actually I think the way I look at it is the total assessment for FY19 for Chatham and Harwich 
is still less than a 2% increase per year since FY11. So we've, we've been managing to keep the budget relatively reasonable for, you know, for our tax base. Mayor Harwich definitely benefited in this merger is when it came to building this new high school. You know, one of the things that that uh, sort of propelled Harwich to really think regionalization is that at the time they needed a new high school. Uh, NIAS, which is the accrediting body, you know, basically said that there needed to be a new facility, um, but how do you go pay for that new facility? And uh, so in the process of regionalizing and building a new high school with a partner, the, uh, the two towns were able to save a significant amount of money by doing this together. Uh, in terms of the high school, the high school was, uh, was voted on by the taxpayers to be a $36.5 million project. Uh, we got wonderful incentives from people like Compact and others to go bring that cost down. Uh, and uh, we had uh, 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 Katie Isornio and Don McCurr, our business team, uh, were able to go and make sure that we had great financial monitoring of the project. So the ultimate borrowing that, uh, that we're gonna have for the high school, instead of a, a bill of 36 million for our towns, it's really gonna be $28 million. So there's a $8.5 million savings there that our taxpayers are going to realize compared to what they voted upon for the for the facility, and uh, part of a share of that, you know, that's six point you know, six point three million dollars. So, and so it was nice to see a project come in significantly under budget and on time instead of being one of those construction projects that that was way over budget and late. So to uh, to do some quick. Looking back at town demographics, and we'll start with the first slide looking way back, and uh, and just to kind of get a little view of what our communities look like. So first, if we go back to the turn of the century, and 1900, uh, Chatham and Harvest were sort of relatively small little communities. 1960s, the population starts to, starts to rock it up a bit, and you'll notice that that around between 1990 and 2000, both of our towns sort of peaked in terms of their population. For the most part, our two towns are fairly built out. Um, and so we've seen, we've seen that sort of peak in population. Now, we've also seen a demographic shift in our two towns, where, you know, where nationwide the median age is 37 and a half, and uh, in, uh, in Chatham, and Chatham, I'm still considered young, um, at 53. Uh, uh, so, so the median age in Chatham is now uh, over 58, and the median age in Harwich just over 53. And, and that that impacts you know, the the demographics of of, of what our schools are going to look like. So, so the more you know, the, the more. Uh, senior population that we have in our two towns, the less ability there is to actually have school-aged children. So we're seeing, you know, that, that does impact what the enrollments look like for our schools. So if we look back on the far left on the graph is 18, or 1985. And if you look there, uh, the, the, both, of these, both of these lines um, see their peaks right around the year 2000, uh, which is the which is the middle of the graph. So this is how far back the state's tracking uh, enrollment, and this is total public school enrollment. So this would be if students are going to Harwich Elementary or Harwich Public Schools in the past, or at Cape Tech, or when charter schools started, if they're going to a charter school. Um, or if they're school choicing somewhere. So this is looking at uh, the reddish line on top is Harwich, just what the Harwich enrollment has been over time and what the Chatham enrollment has been over time. You'll notice that in both cases, the enrollments dipped 
roughly in the last 10 years. But, but what you also see up there is that the enrollment for our schools in both Harwich and Chatham is, tends to be hanging relatively steady um, in, in terms of enrollment in public schools. Now, of course, what are some things that impact Monoli's enrollment? What's, so we've got we've got private schools. So the private school folks, or if you went to a parochial school, is not up there. So the private school is affected, but there's also if kids in a charter school or kids' choice out. So if we look in the last, if we look in the last uh, just over just over ten years here, this is sort of the the story, the story of school choice. For that matter, it's the story of school choice on K five. So. School choice didn't exist until Education Reform Act in, uh, in our state in 1993. And in 1993, uh, if we go back there, uh, Chatham Public at the time graduated 36 kids. And they started to think, maybe we should regionalize. And they went to Harwich and Brewster and Nosset, and they got no from Brewster and no from Nosset. And uh, let's look into it from Harwich, but it did pass, it passed at, at Chatham Town meeting to explore regionalization, but not at Harwich. So, so there, was a, there was a moment in time when it might have happened. But since it didn't happen, Chatham Public said, hey, there's another option to potentially have more kids in our schools. Let's open our, let's open our doors to school choice. So Chatham starts to open its doors to school choice. And the impact is the red line up there, which is Harwich. So when Chatham opens its doors, Harwich starts to lose kids from its schools, and they're heading over primarily to Chatham. Some do ultimately head after 97 to, to Nauset. But we also start to see, um, see us losing some students to uh, to charter schools. Um, but one of the reasons why the charter school lines go at 2011 when they start there, the charter schools open prior to that. Uh, Lighthouse, Lighthouse opens in 94 in Orleans. Sturgis opens in 98. But the state doesn't start tracking charter enrollment. They, they kind of bump that into your total student enrollment. It's not until 2011 that they start tracking and saying, hey, Maybe this is impacting local school enrollments. Um, but the, the punchline up here is the higher these two bars are, it means you know, if, if your student population in your towns is roughly hanging roughly even in the last few years, the higher those bars, the, uh, the more students that are leaving your school, the lower you get, the lower your enrollment. And there's money that flows out of school districts. When it comes to school choice, uh, there's a tuition loss of five thousand dollars per student that includes. There's a tuition loss that's equivalent to the per pupil amount for every charter school student you lose. So you potentially see roughly fifteen thousand dollars flowing out the door for a uh, for a charter school. The uh, I, I think some of the things up here to look at if you just look in the last few years, we're starting to see the charter enrollments decline, which is good. It's, it's a signal that families are becoming more and more happy with what's happening in our schools at the middle school and high school level, and they really should. I, I sent a, a thing off to our school committee last night. Uh, Thursday, the accountability <coughs> data came out with the new test scores and, and the state ranks schools by, you know, by how you're doing, how are your kids doing in terms of their academic results, and how are your kids doing in terms of the growth that's being seen. And, and our middle school has a higher score than, you know, than uh, area, other area um, schools. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, so it's really a testament to some of the great things happening, happening at the middle school right now. Because we're seeing more kids, more families staying, staying with us. Other cautionary tales. Um, there's, you'll notice in, in, uh, on the Harwich line, there was sort of a, a, a 
little upswing there. And I, 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 I've explained this in the past to some. Uh, when our towns uh, squabble uh, over how to fund the schools, families get nervous. And uh, you know, we, you know, we have seen it in other school districts when, uh, when they squabble in the school district to the west of us, more families seek to come this direction to, you know, to our doors. And, uh, and when we uh, have uh, programs that might get cut in our district, families get worried and they, they choice out. And the issue is, you know, you might see 25 kids choice out, but then those kids have siblings who go the following year in the following year, so you, so, so we're, we're still actually in a little bit of a hiccup from, from an event, you know, that happened, that happened a few years back, that we're still in the process of, of turning the other direction. The nice thing is, in terms of the enrollment data that I'll be sharing at both select boards for this year, is that we see both in Harwich and in Chatham, the number of resident kids going to Monterey has swung up in both towns. And the only way that can swing up when your population is of uh, uh, school age children hanging steady is fewer kids are heading out the door. And that's you know, that's a good sign. That's, that's a sign of a, of a community that's starting to see the schools as the place to be. So, uh, I do want to just raise this. Um, I, this is not about, today is not about school choice and whether we should look at an inter-district or, or, uh, it, or um, uh, uh, within an in, in inter-district. But school choice uh, is a challenging dilemma for our tenants. Uh One of the things I just want to quickly emphasize, school choice only makes financial sense to towns if you're filling empty seats. Okay, so if we have a situation, and I'll sort of project sort of uh, kindergarten numbers in a second, but if we have numbers where, let's say, we could have class sizes of 18, and there are, there are 16 kids in the classroom, it makes sense to fill two empty seats with choice students because you can get $5,000 for each one of those students. Um, otherwise, there's just two empty desks. But if we have, if we take in so many kids that we have to add staffing, that's when it doesn't make financial sense to our towns. And, and that's really the cautionary tale of where Chatham Public Schools was. You know, almost a third of their enrollment was coming from outside. Much of it was coming from Harwich, which had Chatham's poor people expenditures way up here. And if you, if you look at where our poor people expenditures are relative to Nauset at the moment, Nauset has much higher poor people expenditures because what we're trying to do is really focus on school choice as just filling empty seats, not, not going and filling classrooms with kids because at $5,000 a child, you can't cover the expenses of the teacher, the teacher's benefits, the teacher's aid, the teacher's aid's benefits, and, and retirement. It just doesn't make good financial sense. Where we are at the kindergarten level, this, this gives you a feel for, you know, for kind of how steady our two towns' populations are. If we just look instantaneously at kindergartners, since 2012 to 2019. In Harwich, it's been, we've had a high of, of, in 2012, 115 students. There were Harwich resident kindergartners. In Chatham, uh, we've had a high of 38. And if we take those two numbers, we take the Chatham uh, kindergarten classes and divide that number by two, we get a number that's about 18 or less. If we take the Harwich numbers and divide that number by six, we get a number that's roughly 18 or less. 
in those years. If I, so if we look at, at any particular grade level at our elementary schools, our steady state right now in both towns seems to be about two sections per grade level in Chatham and six sections per grade level in Harwich. And when we first came together as Monomoy, we were actually carrying three sections in Chatham and six sections in Harwich, which meant that we really had one staff person in excess if we want to keep our class sizes at 18 or below. So we were, we were bringing in initially more choice students to kind of support that extra teacher but financially it didn't make a lot of sense. What we've tried to do is to bring this to a steady state of, of two and six, which makes sense down the road because this high school can sustain families sticking with us if we've got two sections in Chatham and six sections in Harwich. If we have, if we were to have nine sections and actually have them all filled at the elementary level, we potentially overfill the high school down, you know, down the road. So, so that's you know that's one of the challenges that we have, and you know, and then for those that have been part of different conversations at the elementary level, this is having an impact on on how we staff the two elementary schools and what the total number of students are at the uh, at the two elementary schools as we start moving forward. So, just to, to wrap up my presentation um, part. Fiscal challenges that we have. Um, the, the first, they, these are challenges that, that impact one year's growth in one year. Ideally, what you want to see in a school district is maintaining level services to families. And, you know, and again, you know, the, that, that cautionary tale there is you know, if for whatever reason we end up in a situation without level services, we you know, we run the risk of seeing families flee. And, and the challenge that we see is when families flee, tuition goes with them. So you actually end up, you actually end up in a situation where you, 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 know, you try to save so much money um, cutting a program, but you see potentially more money heading out the door in tuition dollars heading off to another school district. And, and that's, you know, that's, what happens in a school choice environment like we have here on the Cape? You know, so when there, you know, when there are cuts in a neighboring community, the families want to come some other direction, seeking what they, you know, what they were looking for. So it ends up costing you on that on that side. The uh, the other big challenge that I know the towns face, that we face, and if you run a local business, I know you're facing that too. It's just health insurance is going up at a rate far greater than what the uh, you know what your average increases are happening. So we talk in a in, in a, uh, a setting about a two and a half percent increase in the in the state capping increases that way. Um, health insurance is going up at over eight percent a year over the last five years, and health insurance alone. Is responsible for over one percent increase in the monthly budget in any given year. And so, it's, you know, so that that is probably one of the biggest drivers out there uh, in terms of making sure that we keep the staffing or the services level for kids. The other areas that are challenging to uh, to keep the the, the uh, educational programs in place that. that uh, Families that families need is uh, when we look at the high needs numbers in our towns. The state defines high needs as students that are special education needs, English language learners, and students that are impoverished. Our special education numbers actually have been tracking fairly steadily over the last five years or so. Where we see an explosion in the numbers are on our families that are dealing with uh, uh, poverty and our families that that have children who need support to learn English because those are things that the school districts now having to kind of backfill and, and support. 
The other number that I put up here at the bottom of the screen that is growing in our in our numbers that's uh, this that isn't tracked by the state and it's hard to want to put your finger on it is trauma. That we're seeing more and more kids that are coming with different sorts of needs and you know, and granted poverty can be something that can lead to trauma, but you know, you know we have a, a huge percentage of our students are living with grandparents and uh, or living with other relatives that aren't their parents. We have, uh, we have a significant number of our families that are doubling up living with other families because they can't afford a housing, you know, housing on their own. And you know that, that is sort of a, a growing challenge for the school district. Uh, if we look at uh, English language learners for a second, if we go back to 94, as far back as the state tracks this number, 94 uh, students that listed English as the first or as the second language at home were relatively non-existent in both Harwich and Chapel. There were a few, but it was it was fairly negligible. That's reaching 10% of our current student population, one in ten kids. And one of the things that you might just be sensitive to today, if you look around the room, we don't represent people that are gathered here today don't represent that voice. One in ten of us are not in that in that category. And I think we have to keep that in mind as we as we talk about today. So just speaking, just that you, you know, your parents may speak for you speak a different language at home, that doesn't mean that you have educational needs. It's it's if you if your child's designated as, a, as an English language learner. So at the moment, about one in, in 20 students in our school district are ELL students, English language learners. So they need extra staffing, they need extra supports to help them understand English so that they can learn the other topics that, that we're covering. So that, again, if we go back in time, relatively small, that's increased. And then just the last, uh, the last little slide that I'll present is uh, just where poverty has headed in the last couple of years. So last 10 years, we've seen a doubling of the families that uh, are financially in need. So that just gives you a quick overview of, of some of the trends. But at the end of the day, on my end, you know, I started here you know, five years ago talking about this promise of mine. You know, what I want to see us do is to continue on that promise, to see us continuing you know, to improve that curriculum, to see us try to find different ways to expand opportunities to our kids, and to be at the same time sensitive to what's the bottom line for our taxpayer. So I wanted to invite uh, Bill Burkhead up here to just talk about uh, public school. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Scott, for the introduction. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that uh, Scott talks a little bit about budget. We always work in our own home, too, as trying to be as frugal as possible. So I think you'll appreciate the first of Scott's work in our setup today. A couple of screens, project our presentations, and then later on we can all jump in on this and the jumping hop. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jim, for that. Um, Today what I want to talk about, I was fortunate enough to get the first ever principal at Waterloo High School and I had previously been the principal at the Manning Middle School in Bedford and before that I was assistant principal a long time after I was a coach and teacher. And it was my dream job at the time, uh, opening this beautiful brand new school uh, called the Bells Human Souls, but also after researching each town thoroughly that commitment that was made to bringing something alive like this, joining together two towns appreciating that challenge. And in five short years, a lot of what we've done when I speak about today is building culture. And part of that culture starts with a lot of new traditions, keeping some traditions that were in check, from both Howard and Chad, uh, paying very close attention to that, appreciating each 
uh, tradition. We also started some of our own. One on the left up there in these two monomer diagrams, you'll see I put this in my front slide. That was a drawing of the contest that was held before I was on board in 2014 um, of the new, new logo, which is awesome by the way, and copyright. Um, that was drawn by Emma Mott, a student in fifth grade at the time, and then graduated last year. So uh, we have a special ceremony and, and we gave her a plaque with that drawing on it, but I want to see the close resemblance and change it a little bit. But uh, that was created by one of our students. You see it everywhere around our school. Today I'm going to give you a best I can in a 15 minute time frame, a little overview of where we started and where we've come at high school. And I'll start, I guess, with a story, uh, I love stories, and the best way is to teach. Uh, that's loosely based on facts. So my mom goes uh, down to her basement, and her son's asleep and he's late for school. And she, like any mom, you know, shoves him, wakes him up, wake up son, wake up son, we have to get to school. Son ignores her that two or three times. He knows the cold water is eventually going to get thrown on his face. He looks over and says, You know, Mom, come on, just a little bit, a little bit long, a little bit long. No, you have to go to school. It's important. It's important to get to school today. And so finally, she says to him, Give me two good reasons why you shouldn't go to school. He says, Well, Mom, that's fine. He says, uh, I annoy the kids, and the teachers don't, don't like them too much. And I think that would impact the mom. Mom could step back from the school and look right back at it and say, We need to suck it up and get to school. It's not good enough to get up and get to school. Then the boy, his last kid shepherd, get out of this, said to uh, his mom, Mom, now you give me two good reasons why I should go to school. And the mom thought about it for a little second, looked right back at him and said, Because you're 45 years old and you're the principal. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, that's a good place for the fact. Mom will live in his basement. School is great, so I wanted to share that quick story with you, day in the life. So I talked a little bit about culture. Um, I think any business school, anything that we're involved in here as adults, um, that's my firm belief that we need to start from culture as a foundation. Here at Culture, uh, it's taken a few years to develop. Keep in mind we're bringing two different rival high schools with very unique strengths, weaknesses, abilities, traditions under one roof. In fact, when the school was built, we were still working on a box for those first few weeks. It was highly stressful, uh, exciting, and all these things, a lot of raw emotion. That was the adults. And the kids were excited, they were here, but just pictures of that. So, a lot of things going on there, and a lot we had to do. So, the foundation of that was to say, okay, we have a child, we have power, which, what is Monomoy? A lot of the conversations were based, were based on that. What is Monomoy High School going to look like in the future? Based on its strengths, of both schools. And a lot of work went into that. Um, and I think the overarching phrase that has come up, and this came from students primarily, is a lot of what we talked about here this voice student voice, parent voice, and teacher and administrative voice, all coming together. That when it comes to creative kids, there are so many smart people. Okay, my job is just to try to find ways to say yes. And uh, in this case, uh, our home away from home is kind of our theme. We three years ago, our class president, I think, uh, Graduation speech ended with that in part of the speech. He said, Monomoy is like a home away from home. And if you think about it, that's really important because students spend a lot of their time in school, a lot of the time with peers, with teachers, meeting new people, building life skills, not just MCAT skills, whole life skills for the half of all the real world. So we set a set of core values that we believe in collectively and we try to follow them every day and base all our decisions on that. So that's the foundation of Strong culture. In fact, Scott talked about class choice. And my, after my first year, there was this big, big budget dilemma and conversation, and people were fleeing in mass. I was really nervous as a principal because I know part of what I bragged about in becoming a principal is people said, you know, how are we going to define a great school? And I said, well, people will walk into school choice, I think people will walk into the road, people will leave. And when you've got a great school, they will come. So after that first year, people started fleeing. Uh, but with concerns, things worked out, things went well. It was great, everyone came together. Uh, since then, uh, people look to our school district as, as a place to be. Uh, we had 49 new students in our school this year. Our guidance office was back this summer. 49 new kids. A lot of them from out of the country, out of the state. Everyone knows they go online and research schools, parents, guardians, do their homework. And we do, we have intakes of students, we ask them why. 
and it was now very long. We're one of the few schools, if you notice, our districts that don't have a of radio or newspaper. Because word of mouth is the best asset. We're doing a job of that. So people are coming on. So that's really exciting for us. And it's overarching being here at the high school is you are important. You probably see signs around the school. You're going to venture around and in the classrooms. Everything we talk about. That's one of us. It's the same core values. Every single student, every single adult, every single guest, every single person is treated as important. With respect, dignity, with pride. We always start with that nucleus. And then we work from there on the students' education. And I think that's been a real strength in our school. We're really proud of that. I'm going to show a quick video of two minutes. Because I added a little bit to it because I'm not a 
person that likes film art, and I just put not anymore on blue sticky, and it still hangs in my office. And now we're up over almost 15 percent. We're getting closer to 100 every day. So I think that was a huge accomplishment for us. But I also want to share that it all hasn't been rainbows and unicorns. I want to highlight next a couple of things that we do because I did talk about the whole child. Uh, it's not all about um, you know poor academics all the time. There's a lot of opportunities here. I think that's what attracts people. Our athletic program started out very small. We offer 22 uh, varsity sports and several other JV and uh, combination eight and nine grade sports. Over the short five day, uh, year period, we had a self-sectional finalist in our, for two years, and our boys basketball team has really been thriving and building up. And seven Cape and Island Lakes championships in the past two years. You'll see across in the gym if you get a chance. Uh, donation was made, a class donation of all beautiful new banners. The problem with those banners, the first couple of years, they were empty. And now they're starting to fill up with championship and sectional titles. So that's really something the kids are proud of. Um, but almost uh, as important uh, to winning is what we offer in our athletics that we believe is really unique here. We want our athletes to be leaders, role models in our school. We need to take action on that. So a few examples I'll share with you here is that we have all key participation in the Captain's Council leadership training. So our captains meet with our athletic director, um, I think bi-monthly, and are trained on how to be leaders. If you think about it, think back you know, when I was a captain. I was just voted on by the team or by the coach, and I was on my own. We need to teach kids how to lead and how to do it respectfully. And we do have those workshops for our students and our captains, and they all thought how to lead and how to be responsible. So I think that's a huge part of our ethics, but we won't see it then. Um, three student ambassadors to the NIAA, the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association. We commit to that, choose student leaders from that leadership group that travel to the state association are trained by them as well, and bring back community service and learning ideas to their teams, and that spreads through our schools. They also act as uh, leaders to teach other students and teams. So I think that the whole goal here is that leadership spreads out to all teams. Uh, another one, all fall sports teams participate in community service. I'll make you a couple examples of the parade and cranberry festival. Over the next few years, we want our winter and spring sports to all do that with the goal. Every single sport and team is pretty powerful when you get three or four hundred kids per season going out and impacting the community positively. It sends a real good message and it's a real good thing to do. It's a big part of our school is that uh, civic responsibility. So that we're doing in our athletics. So you can see, I'm not, men not mentioning wins and losses so much here because that's really not important to us. It's really about everything else we do to build leadership and build class citizens. Uh, the All Sports Booster Club we started just a couple years ago. We didn't have one and we still have one. A lot of things we have here at the high school built from scratch. Built as model. It's thriving now. It's really strong. And I hope we encourage you all to do a little club back in the golf tournament. I'm going to post that. And I said, Tony has been really uh, trying to post behind our push clubs. I want to thank her. And then uh, if you go on our website, all the athletic schedules are there. It's really nice when the kids get to see community members there uh, that are not their parents. I think they appreciate that. We appreciate that. So next, I'm going to, because I don't want to get into too much uh, over my time, but I'll go briefly through these. It is amazing to me you know, the uh, amount of opportunities that kids have in the arts. It blows away most schools three times our size or greater, uh, and, and with a handful of staff members, because it's all about people. These, these teachers and educators are picking up curriculum and our program of study the second now I'm going to give you some examples of what our children are exposed to here at the high school. Some of you have experienced this, some of you have not. So this is just a few slides of the opportunities that kids can take as four classes or electives once they come to our school. So we've got select choir, chorus, band, band separate out into younger kids that are learning, eight and nine. We have 10 and 12, music theory, history of rock, rock uh, a jazz band, women's a cappella, name a few there. And then when we get into our art, we have foundations of art. We also have to keep current with uh, our times, we have digital art. Printmaking, ceramics portfolio, art administration, advanced media materials arts, and studio art. 
So there's absolutely something for everybody and more. And then we go on with photography. We've got some of the best um, computers and, and photography equipment. And so we have photography and advanced photo, graphic design, and we're always thinking about new classes to keep current with the times. And we have applied design, which is a 21st century method to deal with real world scenarios and get our kids thinking creative and to be on the front and the other college and have advantage when they present their portfolios to the college for application. Our kids will have the advantage of having those. And then we have something that you haven't seen that I recommend you do. We have one of the best digital uh, TV studios that I've ever seen. It's better than some TV stations and we use it very well. We have Digital Media 1 and 2. Uh, our only students create the uh, news every day. We have some of the stars in the program. Yeah. Uh, we, we pipe those to the TVs of every classroom. So every morning to start our day, our students deliver the news. And if you go behind the scenes the days before that, you'll see them just like a newsroom, scurrying out to get the sports report. They're going to have to interview another student for a story they're covering. All that's brought together under one uh, TV studio and shared with the entire school every single morning. And it's posted on our website, so I encourage you to go check it out. Everybody in the community can be abreast of what's happening in our school day to day, digitally, via video. Something amazing doesn't happen. There's a lot of schools still that I can still visit that principal meetings morning announcements. Okay, that doesn't happen. Either. And the theater arts class, if you've been to a show, you know they're second to none. Uh, we have classes, we have singing, dancing, acting, a pit band, uh, production crew. There's a lot, like in the real world, there's a lot of arts for the movie theater. Our kids can, based on their passions, can join any part of that be part of it. Costumes, makeup, design, don't have to just be the actors and actresses. Then finally, I'll just put a quick list up here. If that wasn't enough, and you've got an interest, keep your interest, these are just some things that we offer after school or clubs and activities. Um, and some things that we have done at the office. Um, in Jim Collins' book, Good to great, which is one of my favorites. He analyzes, his team analyzes thousands of businesses and look at the ones that um, move from good to great. A lot that stuck at good. He talks about uh, great being the enemy of good. He talks about schools specifically in one part of the book because he says people are content with good schools. No one's going to complain if kids go to a good school. No one was a good school. No one high school is a good school. But what ends up happening is get places appreciate being good. What we often talk about here is that we're never satisfied with being good. That we're always looking to be great. The best school in Massachusetts. We all know that Massachusetts leads the country typically and the world comparatively in education. So if one way to be up here in Massachusetts in the state, we can be one of the greatest schools in the world. And we use that terminology. It's a lot of work and we're not there yet to share with some of our challenges. So what we did when we started out was we got students, staff, parents, surveys. We asked a lot of questions, kind of like we're doing today. And we, these are some things that we came up with, some trademarks that we had to work on to make our school uh, even better. And just highlighting a few, um, something we're still working on is our NCAS state standard test scores on where they act and where they need to be. Expand learning opportunities to challenge highly motivated students. So our kids that are thinking at the top here, how do we even push them even, even harder and higher? And exponential learning opportunities. The traditional high school has math, science, English, social studies, and handful of items. You'll see here that we've expanded into things like community internships. We have almost half of our senior class actually here going out into the community, working with our community, doing real jobs <coughs> that Northeastern University does. We do it for free here. Why wait till college is our thought. Kids go out and do internships. Yeah, highly successful. It also builds people strong community connections. Um, the next one we have there is interventions for struggling learners. The typical high school, what they'll do is the, if you're not doing good in your math class, what happens? You have to stay after school and do more math. What's the motivation for a student that's not doing well in math, doesn't like math, that's going to stay after school instead of going home and have to play the state for math? They don't. If they're chasing, they're they finding, they're forcing to stay after school. What we've done in our grad school is we found time during the school day to offer those children support. And I think that's a key, something unique about our school. And then leveling the playing field for all 
students will talk a little bit about that. Um, and improving transition from students from grade 8. The initial challenge that we have is 8th grade is not the typical high school year, it's usually 9 through 12. So a lot of questions came from parents when I first took over as well. 8th graders, how are we going to include them? How are we going to include them in the fabric when they're still a little bit young? Okay? Here's, here's some action. Um, these are all the things basically started. I'll just highlight a few over the last five years that have had a huge impact thanks to the data that you see. Um, I talked about the internship. We were losing kids to Dennis and Young in summer school. Where they weren't going because it was too far, they couldn't afford it. So what do we do? We start our own. I feel the advantage and kids get scholarships that couldn't afford it, the level playing field. Now all the kids that have to meet summer school, extra help they need, come here. We do with teachers they know and trust that go to work at our school. This is one example. Um, and some other things, the, uh, the PSAT that we look up there, the MSQT, the National uh, Merit Scholarship Qualifying. Again, we used to have and have nots. Colleges that are requiring SATs, the kids that are poor that can't afford it, don't have the means, they don't take the practice test, don't do as well in the testing if they do take it. What we decided to do is we offer all kids, eight and nine in our school, all kids, 11, 10 and 11 in our school, free of charge during the school day. And research that shows if you take that test over a course of time, your scores in the SAT will go up, and your competition level will go up against kids that are competing for college spots. So that's something that you need to watch for the community to make sure that all kids have a lot of faith. And real quick on some uh, data points, you can see basically the big bold numbers without drowning with numbers. The number of students from the state of that have taken the real SATs, practice ones, has doubled. Boom. That's simple. It's working. Graduation rates went back. This was 76 point something. We're in the front page. It's now close to 93. And that will continue to go as we work harder with that. Okay, and that's a trend. Three years is a trend. It's not a, you know, you see we went from 80 to 89 to 92. It's continuing to go up. Good news there. And I won't get too much into the jobs tomorrow. This is one of our in school opportunities for kids to get rich and support. What is unique about this slide is that there's high 80s and 90s across the board for teachers, parents, and kids. You notice everyone has a voice here. This is a highly successful program. And one of the ones that I like here is the high 90s from kids and parents. The stress level of this program has been reduced for our children. Hugely important in this day and age. And then just something since we started our school year, we looked at kids coming into our school with a lot of kids feeling like there's one or more classes. We've reduced that for four years with that the total uh, number of kids feeling courses has decreased by almost 60% because of all the new initiatives that support during the school day. Letting kids know that they have help here. The overall number of kids feeling one class is almost 60 percent Dramatic change. So those are things we're very proud of. Uh, advanced placement, those folks who take advanced placement, we really put, um, added a bunch, as Scott mentioned, added a bunch of AP classes. Back in 2013-14, before we were regionalized, this is combined numbers. Combined Howard and Chichata had 44 kids taking the test and took 87 tests. Since then, we put a heavy emphasis on this. We've doubled it. So I think the number of students taking AP classes and taking the exam has doubled since we've regionalized again. I learned pushing on your high is working. And then our last slide here is what our focus on is to avoid complacency. Uh, the new accountability system that you see out it made it uh, a little more, uh, or includes a little more things we focusing on that. Our MCAT scores, to be quite honest with you, have been average. They haven't been great. They need to be better. So that's something we'll be focusing on. And then a new civics first class, we start this year in grade. The math Foundation course, which is another course with math that helps kids that are not doing well. And our ultimate goal of moving from good to great, we're kind of in the middle right now. So I want your help to make this great. So thank you very much for your time. So, once what I realize about school leaders, having been one myself, once you get us going and talking about our schools, it's hard to stop us because we're excited and we live what we do. I wanted to frame the next couple sessions so you know what's coming forward for you. Uh, so we're going to listen to and be um, grateful for the
presentation by the middle school principal. Then I'm going to have you do a little stretch break with me. It's like a little calisthenics, a little movement, and then the two elementary principals will present, and then we'll get into your doing the rest of the work for the day. So if you'll hang in there with us on our presentations, the principals work really hard, and you can tell how incredibly proud they are of the staff, the students, and their leadership. So Mark, I'll invite you up. Thank you. Well, Jim gets the slide deck set. <clears throat> my name is Mark Wilson, I'm from Lamont Middle School. Prior to coming here three years ago, this is my fourth year, I was the curriculum director in Falmouth Public Schools, so we've seen K 12 instruction and curriculum assessment there. And then uh, some principal experience up in central Massachusetts uh, in Spencer. Uh, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce, I think, a different perspective than what you've heard so far. Uh, I'm going to look at this very much from a student's point of view. and steal a little bit from Bill, and steal a little bit from Scott, and give you three words. Growth, and good to great. <coughs> three things I'm gonna focus on from a student's perspective, and I think everyone in the room is probably can connect what you wanna to bring today in one of these three places. Can we help our students grow here? And here? in their hands and skills that they have, and here in their hearts. It's what we do at the middle school, we try to put programs in place so that our students go five, six, seven, come out with stronger minds, joy and pride, and more skills. I'll dive into this real quick and then come back out. Teaching is a lot about asking questions. I told my staff, we pay you to use words. It is a profession of words. So when I ask you to put together lessons and projects, I'm asking you to ask good questions. So learning by thinking, are we asking better questions at the middle school? And the superintendent asked if I could share with you both challenges and successes. So the answer to that question is, yes, is our student growth over time? We're looking for that magic number of 50. So our students are making a typical year's growth and a typical and one school year. This is for ELA. In 2015, when the middle school opened, the number was 43 for all of our students. We're making less than typical growth. 38, that's my first year in 2016. I wasn't happy with that number the same way Bill wasn't happy with his graduation rate. We talked about what we could do to ask better questions in all of our classrooms, not just ELA. We did some professional development and we see the results, 59 and 57 for the last two years. Overall, our students in the middle school in ELA, that's the core ability of literacy, are growing more than one year as they spend their time in the middle school. Here's Matt. She was the last four years overseeing our students' growth in the subject of math. And of course, this is always a shared responsibility. It's not just our math teachers who get to take credit for this. Our STEM teachers, our science teachers, we have math embedded all over the place in our art classes and geometry. Just so you know what these numbers mean, 50 is typical growth, 40 to 60 is average. So if you hit 60, you get to be what's called exceeding average. If you hit 80, you're a blue ribbon school, and the state calls you to find out what you're doing, so they can replicate what you're doing everywhere else. If you get below 40, the news is bad. If you get below 20, the state shows up and says, we're going to take over. But this doesn't tell the whole story. That 67 and that 57, I'd like to drill down for you and find out whether we're asking better questions to all the students in our buildings. This is the part where I've got three groups I'm going to highlight for you. Our at-risk students. We talked about some of these students. They might be PL students. They might be special education students. They might be students who are dealing with some social-emotional uh, learning traumas in their home. They could be kids that have uh, severe medical disabilities, be students who just struggle with learning. That's one of our groups. Our next group is what I call on the fence. They're almost to proficiency. 500 is the score for proficiency in the went past. This is a group that's like 490 to 492, 494, 96, 98. They're on the fence. They're not quite college or career ready, but they're not far off. And our last group is anyone who's at 500 or above. They're ready for a new challenge. 
Here's last year's grade five, this year's grade six, broken up by the different categories. Our successes, look at the far right, we've got our top half of our students, these are students who are college and career ready, or on track to be, and are we asking the right questions of those kids? If you see a 50, it means that they're making a typical year of growth in one year. Our top half are making 67.7 and 77.5. We are challenging them appropriately. We're asking the kind of questions that bring them exceptional growth. It's above 60. 80 is the magic number when the state calls us and says, what are you doing? Our third quartile is our on the fence kids. Those are the ones who are hanging right around that 500 magical number that says they're proficient on MCAS. We're doing pretty well. We'd like to be doing better, but they are making at least typical growth in one year and slightly better. Our special education population, it's nice to break that group out. Certainly from this population, there are students that fall here, there are students who fall here, and there are students who fall here. So do not make the assumption because on the left-hand side of the map here that they're the at-risk, I just broke that group out. We want to make sure that those students who are getting some additional support services are getting at least that 50 number that they are. The challenge we have for us is our average student they are not making one year's growth in one year's time from this year's sixth grade, and we need to do a better job to support them. Part of the conversation that we can have today across this room is what can we do for students as a community to help sure, make sure they do not fall off far behind. Here's our growth by group at grade six, this year's grade seven. Again, look over that the far right is our top 50%. We're doing an exceptionally good job of having them make almost a one and a half years growth in one year. Same thing for our uh, on the fence group, fantastic. Our at risk group, our fourth quartile, we still haven't gotten to 50. Our special education population has gotten to 60. That exceeds expectations. Just so you know, this is comparing like students. So when I say uh, top 50, that's like if you compare that group to the other top 50 students, not top 50% of us also in Massachusetts. And here's the current grade 8, last year's grade 7. Good news pretty much everywhere, and the challenge remains the same for us regardless of which grade level. So one part about the most when we take this big look is are we making the right growth in terms of the questions we're asking and the kind of growth our students are making? And the answer is yes. Ahead. So the first, the hand second. Are we giving students an opportunity to provide authentic challenges? What kind of hands-on experiences are we giving them? And at the middle school we get some really cool things going on. I have a lot of text from this point out, it's mostly slides. Vernal Pools, we partnered up with uh, the Chatham Conservation Partnership and we've built two vernal pools on the edge of our property. Our students go out there regularly as part of their science instruction. They're monitoring the growth of those pools and the species that are moving in, sharing that data in their science classes, and they're actually become stewards as those pools went from empty ponds to uh, vibrant wildlife. It's been awesome. Here's our geography fair for our sixth grade students where they come out and share, they've done some research on a particular country and they're going to present that country to the community. It's probably a well attended event, the place is packed uh, and our students are very much proud of the work they've done and the information they're going to share with everybody. Here's some students who are in Latin, practicing, uh, rehearsing their uh, Latin scenes they're going to present to each other uh, in their presentation. Here's our STEM in science on the left doing some robotics design, a built bridge building. On the right hand side, we have students who are exploring some work in chemical analysis. And we're adding first robotics. I could go on for a very long time, I'm not going to. Go into. The number and opportunity for our students to be involved in hands-on exploration and creativity is incredible. I got to do five slides. And walk you to the building and show you nonstop where our students are doing this. And the heart. There's an old adage that says, I might forget, you might forget what I said, but you will always remember how I made you feel. We believe that in middle school, we practice that. Are we providing uplifting experiences and joyful memories for our kids? I'll let the slides speak for themselves. Why is that? Uh, <laughs> whole school field trips up to, uh, we do a whole school field trip. This one happens to be up to Billy Elliott up at the Wheelock Family Theater, where the whole student body goes as a shared experience. It's going to be a quick anecdote. 
my first year we did this old school field trip. I didn't know of no other principals in Massachusetts who do an old school field trip. It's pretty uh, bold. We had to leave before the school day started. We didn't have transportation for the I mean, bus. We left the school at 7 a.m. School day started at 8 mm -hmm. Parents were lined up for miles to drop their kids off. And every single one of them dropped their kid off with a smile. And more than one of the cars said, This is the first time I feel like I'm part of a large community. Transition. I'm going to different schools, even if I'm part. Here's a group of our seventh graders on a volunteer experience in Washington, D.C. This year we've got 85 students doing that on the Monday and Tuesday before um, Thanksgiving. Here's our jazz and chorus rehearsing and practicing in front of the community, sharing the skills they've learned all year long. Here's our evening of inspiration, one of the things we do for that at-risk group that is not making progress. You reach out to them, we provide an evening where we invite all of them to come on a Friday afternoon to remain from 3 o'clock to 8 o'clock at school on a Friday. They're going to get dinner, they're going to meet with their teachers, they're going to get help from their help sessions and support. They are going to uh, have a leadership activity, they're going to have an outdoor uh, uh, sports event to get them bonded. And you can see the smiles from the groups on the, on the bottom there. All of the students that you see are generally in the room because they're getting C's, D's, and F's and struggling to connect with the faces. Making connections to the head, the hand, and the heart the kids that we have in our school. And I'd ask you, and this is why you're here today, where do we go from here? The fourth thing, instead of head, hand, and heart, we look at middle school's character. We want our students to have character leaders in the service. Here's our sixth grade curriculum for all our students on the finest hours, learning about local geography and history. And the rescue that was made off of uh, Chen and Bar's Inn. That was Chen Bar. After Chen Bar. There may be many rescues after Chen Bar. <laughs> off of Chen Bar's uh, in the 1950s when two oil tankers built apart. They're actually meeting with some of the uh, family members and the Coast Guard to hear about that project and they read the fine stylers in the text. They're learning about our local community heroes and having a bunch of them. Here's our students as they spend a weekend, uh, Saturdays, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, <coughs> as uh, Seacoast camps, uh, learning about nature and writing about nature. Here they are now on the left hand side at the uh, Massachusetts Senate, and on the right hand side at the uh, um, Memorial Wall in Washington. And here's a group of students who Last year, we were out on Mill Creek building an oyster restoration reef. Um, I was actually out there, I did with them on Thursday at 7 a.m. 16 students were rowed before the school day started. They had out of service to our community, rebuilding an oyster reef. I can give you another thousand uh, photographs on this. These students are making a difference in the community, they're making a difference in themselves. One of the things I will share the last 10 slides. None of the things in the last 10 slides happened during the school day. A school can be good from its opening time of for us 8.45 to 3.15. What makes the school great is all the things that are happening before school, after school, on the weekends, over the summer. I would be remiss if I did not tell you that the middle school staff is extraordinarily dedicated to give students opportunities to be learning here, here, and here, outside of the school day. All the photographs of us will be in our stuff that happens weekends, holidays, 7 a.m., Sundays. So let's build something great today and put it together. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, this is not an invitation to leave the world. It is an invitation to stand up. So, let me please stand up. And I'm going to ask you as Robin and Bill gets ready to do her presentation for Chad Elizabeth. Perfect. Stretch as high to as the both hands. I can't do both without you doing one. Please stretch really high and bend to the side one way. Bend the side the other way, and then I would like you to 
take a deep breath down through your lungs and through your diaphragm. In, out. One more point. Deep, deep, deep. In, out. Turn it around and sit down. <laughs> lunch, is, uh, lunch is two elementary schools away. And here's the thing these elementary schools are as incredible as the presentations that you've seen from the middle school and the high school. And it really excites me to frame this work so that this afternoon you can roll up your sleeves and be challenged to say, how can they possibly be better? Because moving from good to great means we are always growing and learning. So thank you, Robin. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad Patty did that with all of you because I was thinking if I was teaching right now, I would have had you all stand up and do a couple of laps around the classroom. It's what we used to do in my classroom when I taught. I am Robin Hill and I am the principal of Chatham Elementary School. I've been with the district almost five years. Prior to that, I don't know if I can use this type of thing, but um, the, um, I was a teacher for many, almost 20 years in the state of Connecticut. I'm originally from this area, though I'm thrilled to be back. So I did also have a, my own unique take in some ways on framing the context for you all here. I figured you were going to hear a lot from us in the hour, two hours now that we've been talking. So I went right to our source. Um, right to our children to tell you about the successes and the challenges and where um, Chatham Elementary School has become and gone to since that they transitioned to um, Montgomery Regional School District. So I basically randomly selected a bunch of children and then I self-selected them to represent the demographics we have at Chatham Elementary School. So the children up there, I was able to get a focus, three focus groups. I sat down with each one of the focus groups. The children that I spoke with represent everybody that we have. Our demographics, gender, age, school choice, inter-district choice, residents of Chatham, aptitude, learning styles, interests, and all their profiles. And I basically asked them three questions. Basically the questions that we needed to consider here today. What are we doing well in their lifetime of being at Chatham Elementary and part of Illinois Regional District? What do you think is the best part of your school since you started? Then I also asked, what would you change? Some of the students are in kindergarten, first grade, some of them are in fourth grade. What would you change about school right now since your experience is here? And then this was the scariest question for them, the third question. I had them sit down and project out three years. Typical strategic plans for three years. So I said, okay, in three years, you're living the Montauk Promise. And outside of Anthony, who about had a heart attack, and he realized he was going to be in fifth grade, and he goes, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in fifth grade, I'm going to be so old. <laughs> They were able to offer us very insightful um, responses to these questions, but I was able to code into three distinct themes, and I'll share those with you right now. The first theme that came out of the responses, and you'll see on the slides, and I won't go through all of them, but on the bottom, I will put your use as I put it up on the um, website, but those are all their responses. So but the first thing that, thing that came up was that CES has a very positive environment. We, it is a power, empowering environment that allows us to socially, emotionally, physically, and ac academically grow. And you can see that from some of the things that they said, like, I love learning with my friends. I love being a shark. I'll get to sharks in a minute. And my teacher helps me learn even when they don't know something. This is evidence of some of the successes we've had with a program or system of support that we call PDIS, which is a positive behavior intervention and support system. And our kids love being sharks. Even though they're not on the shark mom boy football teams or out here at the high school, they're safe, honest, accepting, respectful, kind, successful students. And they love that. And when we, if we within, within this system, if you don't know the system, it basically says that we see sharks. We spot them for doing the right thing. So we can take much more time and say, you're doing, you're following expectations, you're walking down the hallway, right? You're trying hard at work. Um, at your school uh, opportunities, and we celebrate them. We have fancy lunches. We have um, sharks that visit the classrooms when the classrooms are in their class-wide rewards and fill their shark tanks. We give them individual stickers, and some of the moms and dads in this room were so sorry because I know they've gone through the wash and they're sticking to your dryers now. Um, but they, the children love that. They love saying, hey, I got a shark sticker today, and the adults in the building say, what did you get that for? So there's a response back to us. 
So we thought about doing the right thing, and we know this works. Just in the last year alone, we've had a 50% reduction in our behavioral incident rates at Chatham Elementary School, which in our world, we figure every behavioral incident talk costs about 30 minutes of disruptive time. So if you take that with our reduction just last year, we earned back over 7,000 minutes of instructional time just because we saw that our kids were doing the right thing. We also know that children feel safe, our adults in our building feel supported, and we all are doing great things because we have a core value that we want to see you. We don't just look at you academically. We look at you how you're feeling. We celebrate when you have a baby brother. We celebrate when a teacher, uh, we start every um, faculty meeting with appreciations and regrets. We celebrate with our teachers. And we know this works because of the, what up there, it says when we direct, or when we can give and receive without judgment, and when we derive connections and that energy, we receive sentiment and strength from those relationships. So, up here on this slide, here's some of what now Dr. Carver to talk about. These are all the <laughs> all the connections up there of student and adult enrichment that we put in and have at Time Elementary School. Everything that you see in there in red is things that have happened in the last three years. So everything from student mentors. We have visible mentors, we have silent mentors. We have a robotics and a makerspace and happy space club. We also transformed our faculty meetings into not having those traditional faculty meetings that probably some businesses also have, where we do a lot of housekeeping. We've transitioned our faculty meetings to giving our teachers the ability to call what we call empower our learning. So we're empowering our hour, give them the hour, and they're driving their own learning within their school, within their own um, interests and what they want to do to enhance our school. On this next slide is all the connections that we've added over the last three years and other supports that we have in our, that we put into place for our students. We made a commitment when I came on board that not only would we reach out and the school-wide improvement plan had this goal in 2016-2018, we would reach out to the community and ask experts to come in to help our students. Social emotional experts, academic experts, physical, we had the soccer team, the football team, all of those things come in. Everything again in red is new, okay? We also made a secondary um, commitment that we would go out to our community that we would also, as educators, as people who work with our children, empower our community with the knowledge we have. So some of the things that we've done in the last three years is we started working with the Aquaculture Research Corporation just recently. And we have our third grade teachers, and this is who's over there, she should wait, is working on providing 20 aquaculture lessons to our third grade teachers in relationship with the experts at the Aquaculture Research Corporation. We also took a staff field trip this year. We went out on our first days of school when we got back and we got on a bus, 95 degrees, and I thought my staff was gonna kill me. Um, but it was wonderful. We went out into our communities and we visited our families' homes and we delivered welcome back goodie bags and um, school supplies in three neighborhoods. We're hoping to make that a yearly event. It was very well received. And then we also have a community partnership that we just recently started with the Lower Cape Outreach Center and the Greater Food Bank, where we, Chatham Elementary School, now is a food um, bank site. We're feeding 75 students, adults, seniors, in just three months. So theme number two that came out of the um, responses. Now look down here, see all those 10 children? All those responses, every single one of them relates somehow to science, technology, engineering, or math. Our students want more of that. We call them STEM content areas, okay? But when you read these quotes a little bit more carefully, you realize that it is a secondary want. They want STEM, they want the content in STEM, but they want to learn it in their own way. So if you look at the two quotes that I just popped up, when I am in grade five, now this is the projection, when I'm in grade five, I hope we can learn using computers because I want to learn in my own way. I want to learn through watching videos was another response. So we know this is a challenge. This is a twofold challenge for us here at Chatham Elementary School. First challenge is, like almost everybody before me mentioned, we have very strong growth measures at Chatham Elementary School. What we have up there is the MPAS, which is a state test, 
and you have what we call MEP, Measured of Academic Performance. That's basically north to the nation, broader than just the state of Massachusetts. And if you look on average, we have above average growth in both English language arts and in math, except for this year we had a dip in MCAS scores. However, if you look at the bottom, and I just pulled one, I just pulled out grade four as kind of a data set. If you look at grade four, we have above average growth, but we have low average achievement, especially in math. Not unlike the middle school, not in the middle school, but in the high school as well. So we are averaging and actually going above average in the English language arts. So we know this is a challenge. However, we're lucky, because we have one of the best student or school councils. And if they're in here, can you all wave to everybody? <laughs> we knew this was a challenge. We've known it for many years. And in 2016, 2018, and we also knew it was a strategic challenge. Uh, um, Dr. Carpenter talked about math and focus, and we spent a lot of money on um, professional development for our teachers, structural practices. But this, our school, student, our school council reached out a little out of the box and said, we could do this in other ways as well. And what I give you here is an example of one of the goals that we had in 2016, 2018. We had the philosophy that we're gonna change our stagnant library our text-based library into what we call the Learning Commons. It's a three-year process, and basically what that meant was it's almost a physical and philosophical change that you'll see. So we looked at our text base first. Our average publication of our nonfiction text when I took over as principal, and I was so embarrassed, but took over as principal of Ted Elementary School, our nonfiction text, which is science, biographies, geography, publication date is 1986. It was 2016. So if you think about our world and our science advances, what those children were reading in some of those books was not true. <laughs> and some biographies didn't exist. Today, we've made a concerted effort. We actually got into the millennium, okay? We're not quite there yet, but we have updated our nonfiction text base to 2003. <laughs> also in 2016, we made the concerted effort to say, we need this to be the freshest library where children loved check out books, you have lots of text available, new um, titles, exciting titles, graphic novels, all those things that children love to read now. So in the last two years, we've added over 200 books to our library collection. That is also, we had a little problem with the weather this year, so we've added even more than that because we lost a lot of weather, but I, or a lot of books this um, winter because of the weather and we had a leak. Um, it's only not a minute, but I have to thank Kathy Ware, who's here in the office in the building right now, and also Eldridge Public Library for helping us update our collection on a regular basis. The other thing in 2016 was that our library was only open during school hours, and even less than that, we had a library in two and a half days a week. We stopped that. The library is open 24-7, both digitally and in person. Students can access, access their text online, they can access resources, Anything like that, all time, all day, every day. Then we also did a physical transformation, and inside the library, we have added a publishing center. So we've interconnected all the other teachers with the learning commons. They are coordinating in units, they're publishing the work. We also have added a hacker space, which I let Mr. Dark Superintendent Carpenter would know what that is. Is basically, we're not asking them to hack our computers, but basically they're learning as young as kindergarten how to code, program, and how to have a responsible digital footprint. We also have a makerspace. Now that is slow to come because we did lose the roof of this area to the one of those dorms this winter. So the makerspace due to an um, anonymous benefactor will be coming this year, and we also are um, working to write out a bunch of grants so that we can have a uh, broadcasting center so that um, we can actually broadcast live like the high school does. The second part of this challenge for this um, goal that the children brought to us is that we need to meet them where they are. We need to differentiate instruction for our students. And so our new um, school-wide career plan does that. It says we are going to adjust our practices to the children versus the children adjusting to our practices. So we're going to modify with, or adjust our content, our process, our product, our environment, our app, at meeting the students' interests, profiles, and readiness. Our school-wide improvement plan also 
dug way down. I mean, again, this school council did an enormous amount of work, and the staff has done an enormous amount of work, really layering and making our problems of practice transparent. And we realized we had two significant achievement gaps. One is our female students are out performing our male students, where we have action plans to address that. We also had a very significant gap between our economically disadvantaged and our non-economically disadvantaged students. Now, I'm sure many of you read over the last several months about the economic changes in our school population. It's been in the press a lot. Officially, Chatham Elementary School has an economically disadvantaged population of 31.8% according to the state, or state websites. However, we know our economy around here. We know we have a very seasonal employment, we have hospitality, and when we went to apply for a certain uh, provision last year in February, our numbers were at 61.8%. So you know this is going to be something that we need to attack, we need to discuss today, and we need to plan for. Now our last thing, and I'll try to wrap this up as quickly as I can, but is that the students also told us that we want opportunities to learn more deeply than just content. And I think Seamus's quote here is the one that, made, that tells me the most about this one. So Seamus is one of the youngest students I interviewed. He said to me, I want to work on my own to learn about my heart. I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's figure this one out. And he said, I want to know how it works and what about heart helpers. Now, I'm going to translate that in first grade speak. Heart helpers are the AED units that we have inside of our building. Okay, so all the fire department people can explain that to their tables. So, and then he went on to say, so I can see more that heart helpers, or I can see if we need more heart helpers near the second and third grade rooms, the first and second rooms, and the kindergarten rooms. So basically, is what he's telling us is, yes, they want content. Our children want to learn content. But she just wanted us to know if we had a problem. He wanted to know if one AED unit in our school was enough. And then he had a solution. I hope that's not enough. Then we need more of these. And all the fire department people back there are shaking their head on. Um, so we need to be addressing that. And again, I sat back and I was like, wow, I'm an elementary principal. Foundation, foundation, foundation. Learn how to read. Learn your ABC. Addition, subtraction, multiplication. How are we going to do this? It's a challenge. It's an instructional philosophy change. It's also how do we provide those purposeful struggles? You know, to understand a problem, you have to struggle. You have to figure out a solution to that. And we, as elementary teachers, really like to make sure our kids are happy. <laughs> we want to take care of it. So how do we do that with that balance? So I was thrilled to start thinking about what are we offering. And I realized over the last year, our teachers have written over 12 new units. And over 50% of those units are interdisciplinary in some way, meaning that they have language arts and math involved in them. They have science and writing involved in their standards. And at every grade level, I could identify at least one unit that involves some sort of project-based, problem-based, or service learning component within the units that they created. And I'm just gonna give you a quick example. Fourth grade, a couple of fifth graders here that will shake their head. Fourth grade state fair project. That is a traditional Chatham Elementary School project. Probably many of your children that are from Chatham Elementary have done that project. Our fourth grade teachers, I don't think there's any of them here, along with Kathy and some of the other teachers, overhauled that project last year. Yes, the children still learned about the state flag and the chickadees and the, uh, the state birds and you know all those things that we probably traditionally learned when we studied states in school. However, the children were then challenged to find problems inside those states. And problems they found. They found pollution problems, waterway problems, immigration problems. They found pollution, uh, pollution I can't remember, animal cruelty. There was an amazing amount of problems that they realized were facing the states that they were studying. Then they were challenged to find a solution to those problems. So, and they did. <laughs> they found, they used engineering. One group, I really never forget this, they came together and they said, I think the solution is bringing two sides of this topic together and having them do some collaborative problem solving. Fancy idea, right? So they came up with the problems, they came up with the solutions. And that would have been a great unit, but it wasn't enough. They did the traditional activity of presenting, and they presented to the community at large. So they presented to their parents, 
They present it to the superintendent. They present it to the curriculum director. They present it to the selectmen. And they share what they have learned. They share the problems and they share their collaborative problem solving. Again, would have been enough. But no, it didn't end there. The teachers then challenged them to find a change agent in the states that they were studying. So a senator, a mayor, right to the president, the EPA, they wrote to those people, those change agents, they presented the problem that they had found in the states and they presented their solutions. So they had the ability to, to share their learning to a global audience. And it was the end of the year project. I had called all the teachers in July to say, you can come empty your mailboxes. <laughs> because at the end of July, they were stuffed full of letters from all those change agents applauding the children for their ideas, their learning, and their efforts. That's the kind of unit that we need to find and keep doing with our children. So I want to thank you and give a short shout out. These are our uh, guys here. And, you know, at the, when the final reflections of what I got from the children, I sat back and I looked back at the vision of Monomoy, and I know Superintendent Copper um, talked about the mission. But if you look here, I'll just give you a minute to look at it quickly. Children want to be civic. We wanted our children to be civic minded, decision making, confident, flexible in their problem solving, creative, resilient to respond to challenge, attentive to global responsibilities, and ready to succeed in the future. That's what our children are asking for, and I hope today we can continue to work on that promise for them. Thank you. It must be challenging to be the last, but they all often say we save the best to last. <laughs> so, um, as a Howard president, I'm happy to have you um, present Howard Elements. Thank you, Carrie. And I do know that I am standing in between you and sandwiches from the Mason jar, lobster rolls from Town Fish Market, and I also received a text message from the superintendent asking me to keep it under 10 minutes. So, here we go. Uh, Thank you um, for being here today. It's so wonderful to see the faces of the community here, especially the students. Uh, my name is Mary Oldak. I am the new principal of Harwich Elementary. I just started this year. Um, um, I was the assistant principal under Sam Pine um, for three years. Sam has, who I'm sure many of you know, has um, retired. And <clears throat> so today what I'm going to focus on is um, I'm going to build our presentation off of our school improvement plan and our uh, vision from um, that our school council set for our elementary last January. But just to set a um, context for the scale of our school and the diversity of the school, I um, wanted to just um, talk to you about the student body. We have 559 students in preschool through fourth grade at Harwich Elementary. We are one of the largest elementary schools on Cape Cod. We have 105 employees in our building every day. Uh, that includes our certified staff, our instructional assistants, our custodians, our cafeteria staff, and our administrative assistants. Everyone who works very hard uh, to create a welcoming and positive environment for our children. We have 32 classrooms and six unified arts. We have uh, PE, music, art, the library, technology, and Spanish. Um, all of our students, kindergarten through fourth grade, have Spanish. We have 33 English learners who represent 11 different countries, and they represent about 6% um, of our student body, and we know that that um, percentage as in that demographic is uh, just exploding on Cape Cod. 14% of our students receive special education. That's a very typical um, percentage in any public school. And we have about 29% of our student body is economically disadvantaged. And about 49% receive free and reduced lunch. The difference between those last um, two numbers really is economically disadvantaged children also have families that are accessing certain um, public service um, supports such as SNP. 
And we have 9% of our student body who are school choice, and they're coming to us from eight towns. Some of them are um, coming from as far away as Sandwich. This is uh, the Harwich Elementary vision statement that I'm um, very proud to represent as the new principal of Harwich Elementary School. This was written just last January, less than a year ago, by our um, school council. Um, we have a few representatives of our school council here with us today. And <clears throat> as you read that, you can see that it really puts the focus on the whole child and the understanding that as our children are safe, supported, and receiving what they need as a, as a child, they will be able to attend in their learning and achieve academic success. So focusing on that, focusing on providing that safe, stable, and joyful environment, I just love the word joy um, that is in this because that's what childhood and learning should be all about. We're going to uh, just talk to you a little bit from an upside down video. Um, <laughs> I've been assured that when I hit the play button, it's going to flip around. So, uh, as Robin mentioned, both of our elementary schools have a positive behavior support program. And that really has just transformed our school culture here at Harwich Elementary into uh, what we call being fantastic. Fantastic means that you're respectful, responsible, safe, and ready to learn at school. And it's a program that we've just kicked off. We're just going into our third year. And these children, hopefully they won't be upside down, but then you can uh, stand on your head and watch it the other way. But I think it will flip over. There we go. This um, is our first grade classroom singing our school song. Nurturing the development of emotionally and physically healthy child. 
Uh, <clears throat> Harwich Elementary has been impacted, um, as Dr. Carpenter mentioned, by the trauma that our um, children and families have experienced. Um, there's a foundational study that estimates that about 22% of all children have, have experienced some trauma already in their young lives, physical abuse, emotional abuse, living in a home that uh, has a substance addicted parent. Um, we now have on Cape Cod with the opioid crisis, we are now seeing the children who are born addicted now in our schools as students. And our teachers um, were crying out for help for how to support these children. And we partnered with Lovesley University, and um, we have over 20 staff members who are uh, working towards becoming trauma certified. And that's really been very helpful with our placement process and how we support these students. I did want to mention our Lighthouse Leader mentors, um, that Joy I'm sure we'll be talking about later. Um, these children really need um, the established relationships with staff, with each other, and the Lighthouse um, Leader mentors are from within our community. We are finally our second step social-emotional learning. That picture that you see there is principal teacher Jen McGilman with um, Laura Weatherup our speech and language um, therapist in an integrated preschool room, and um, they are conducting a lesson with puppets about um, how to listen um, when someone's speaking. Very fun, um, basic and foundational. These kids are actually just three years old, and um, I'm so proud of our staff. When we asked our pilot teachers, um, we didn't just get pilot teachers for this new program in preschool for second grade. Every single teacher volunteered, so we're actually at implementation. We're rethinking our health education, how do our children learn about their bodies and nutrition, continuing to consider our universal preschool model here in Mottoboy um, with the potential of offering preschool to all children in our communities and within the public schools. And I did also want to mention um, Castle in the Clouds, our playground complex. We're looking at the feasibility of um, the Castle in the Clouds, the preschool playground, uh, the basketball courts, and maybe even the Little League fields as we um, look at the fact that Castle in the Clouds is now 20 years old and has deep emotional roots in our community. And um, we're doing an audit of it at this time and just taking sort of those first steps forward with what uh, the future of the playground complex might look like. When we think about um, the dynamic and integrated curriculum, uh, again, I think all of us have touched upon the fact that <clears throat> our MCAS scores continue to run right around average within the state. Uh, the red stars on this graph represent the state average. And uh, you can see that last year in language arts, we were slightly below the state average, and we were still running at that um, achievement level. In mathematics, last year and this year, we're slightly above. The uh, blue represents the students who are exceeding expectation, the yellow, uh, the students who are meeting expectation. So when you think about how we break free of that average, and as uh, so many of the principals have already mentioned, we're hitting our growth targets, we're providing our teachers with our professional development, we're integrating online learning resources. We have uh, Harwich Elementary has been completely rewired this um, summer. We have um, doubled the number of devices in our buildings for our students. Maker spaces <coughs> are in Harwich Elementary in our technology and library. And we're looking to re uh, rethink our science delivery model, whether it be in a coaching model or a pull-out special. So when I think about how blessed we are with how everything's just coming together and sinking, we have uh, the support we need from the district and from this community and the resources to um, pull together our curriculum, our social-emotional learning is a uh, standard in the state our community engagement, this community is so dedicated to our kids and responsive to our schools and providing our uh, amazing dedicated staff with this, 
professional development they need. You can feel the surge, you can feel how everything's just beginning to connect and sync, and all of that is going to lead to increased student achievement. And as I tell our staff, um, every time we get together, we are not average, as our MCAS scores might suggest. Um, we're just on the verge of, of breaking free of that. I thank you for being here today and helping us work towards that. Thank you for your tolerance, thank you for your interest. And so one of the things that just captured me this morning was there were so many things that surprised me. As a 16-year resident in Howard, I was surprised by still so much. So I'm going to challenge you at your lunch time to please share with your lunch mates what surprised you about what you heard this morning. It can be something invigorating, it can be something a little challenging. But spend your time after you get a bathroom break, after you have your food. Um, but while you're chatting, what surprised you about the presentation this morning? So the next steps, um, this is like a three-step direction. So first and foremost, would you get your booklet out? And Jim, may I borrow yours for a moment? And on the front of your little booklet, Right under your name is the, a name of a shark. And that, if you're not already at that table, please find the table. So this happens to be the hammerhead table. So if you're a hammerhead shark, after you get your lunch, you're going to come to this table. So once you get your lunch, you are to eat at the table that is corresponding to number one. Does anyone go food yet? Does anyone have a question about where you're going to eat your lunch? <laughs> There's nothing worse than interrupting people's discussion and their lunch. And so I have the distinction of doing that. And I forewarned you early on and told you I would be the taskmaster. And so please forgive me and appreciate me at the same time because I'm the person that's going to get you out at 3 o'clock on time. So there's I always used to say to my students, work hard, get out on time. And so we've got the hard work ahead of us. So um, we designed this next part of the afternoon to hear your voices completely. And we will actually upset your bachelor's part a little bit because we're going to rotate you a number of times. So you mix it up, you're talking to people, and at each of your tables, there is a record keeper. So with the record keeper, your record keeper flash facilitator, would you raise your hand? Nice, as I say, loud and proud. Terry, that's you, right? So every table has a record keeper. Great. The, the record keeper, just a clarification, you're sitting in the same seat for the whole afternoon. So when other people move, you do not. All right? Right? So I would be dishonest if I 
didn't tell if I said we're on schedule and rocking and rolling. So I've made a couple changes. That's one of the changes I made. That's that's going to be later, another time even. So I did hear about the challenges, and I heard about the kids, and I heard about the exemplary work. And so I just wanted to frame uh, the thinking one more time. I like this slide, and because it focuses me. A goal without a plan is just a wish. We, if we don't have a plan on how to be the best service delivery school system for the kids in Howard to Monomoy and for those that choose to come here and to attract those that chose to leave to come back, we need a plan. We just can't have it as a lofty goal without a very specific, actionable, targeted plan for the next three years. And that's what this is about. So what is the goal? And it's interesting because I'm working on a strategic planning initiative in another district for technology. And to be honest with you, I couldn't even answer the goal because I'm so challenged by what will technology look like. And so there are multiple paths, as the signs indicate. What's the right path to take to the future? And that's part of the challenge of doing this work. You are going to be asked with your table mates to brainstorm. And so I wanted just to highlight the rules of uh, the rules of brains. Uh, I was looking for a point. Yay! The rules of brainstorming. Encourage wild ideas. Please don't be afraid to say anything that comes to your mind. That's what brainstorming is. And your facilitators and record keepers are there to record your wild ideas. They're here to build on the ideas of others. If, if Diane says something very stimulating to me, then I'm going to say, I like Diane's idea. I think that's great. And what if we did this in addition to it? Stay focused on the topic. That's the facilitator's job as well as mine. So if you're going down a tangent or digging a rat hole, someone's going to say, can we come back to the topic? Please don't be offended. You only have 15 minutes for each of four questions to talk about, so it doesn't give you a lot of time. Defer judgment. Don't say, come here, Nick. Don't say, Deborah, I don't like that idea. We can't do that. We don't have any money. And once you do that, the creative process stalls. So try and, as I say to myself, about myself, just chill your bad self. So keep it in your head and then voice it later because there will be opportunities for that. One conversation at a time, please. And if you want to um, be visual and draw or something, uh, we're happy to take any notes you want to give us. And go for quantity. Quality comes the next phase. Right now, we're looking for quantity. There will be tremendous quality in the end product, but we want quantity of ideas and thoughts right now. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Very quickly. How many see an old woman here? Raise your hand high. Okay. How many see a young woman? Wow, more people see the young woman than the old woman. I'm only going to take three seconds. This is the old woman's nose. Down her mouth and her pointy chin, and she's got a shawl. The point of this is perspective. You might see the old woman, and that's the perspective you're talking from. Someone else might see the young woman. We honor both perspectives. So as you're praying, so you keep perspective in mind, and please don't say, I'm sorry, I disagree with you, Larry. That's not what we're doing today. <laughs> still need lots of opportunities to have creative dialogue back and forth today. It's really about praying. So I very quickly, this is very interesting. Scott and I uh, reflect the same thing very quickly. Grace is my great niece. Graduate of public education, 13 years of public school. She's, I think this one, she graduated in 2016. She's now at Syracuse University. Typical kid going through school, she's successful. Meet Annabelle. 
my granddaughter, first grade. <coughs> Annabelle will graduate in June of 23rd. This is a question I ask myself every day. How will Annabelle's experiences in public education be different from Grace's? The world in 2030 will not be the world of 2016. And so if we need to think audaciously about the future, and I think it's really hard to think about how do the next three years influence 2030, but they do. And that's my challenge to you today, is to think audaciously, even if you're thinking three years, please think 13 years as well. And I just wanted to say there are currently few, fewer and fewer students in the state of Massachusetts are like race. So you'll see that there's an increase in African American, Latino, Asian, multiracial students, and white students are on the decline. We are a diverse, ever growing, diverse society, and so a global mindset is important, and all, we need to be successful with all kids. So I won't belabor that. I just wanted to present that because we're not just thinking about race, and hopefully not just Annabelle, but all of Annabelle's peers that are in her classrooms and in the school. I will, I will highlight this for one second if you don't mind. Massachusetts is number one all over the place, in the world, in certain testing, in the country, but we are not number one in one very distinct area. We have the largest achievement gap by race, income, and language in the nation. That's really startling to think we're number one in so many ways, and still we have the largest achievement gap for our low-income students, our racially diverse students, and our English language learners. And so Massachusetts is going to continue to thrive in 2030 in an ever-increasing population we need to address all students. So just, if you fail with me for a three-minute video, I wanted to sort of stimulate your thinking a bit. I might be my tech friend here. <clears throat> I did pull it up in YouTube. I loaded it. I minimized it. Now I'm a Mac user. I'm sorry. So I should be. Here's what: in, in 2030, I should be able to go across platforms without any problem. <laughs> ah, thank you. I just need to go. <laughs> Definitely a skill set for 2030. So hone in on some of the data that you see here and some of the interesting and potentially challenging pieces of information that will be shared.
um, if the predictions are correct. We have some challenges ahead. <laughs>
should be made in the next three years to advance Monomoy's excellence. So facilitators, you've got your work cut out because you're asking people to think futuristically and three years, all kids at the same time. So, do you want me to do the corn announcements again? Yes. All right. What are your corn to you? Rose corn. Parsnips. Love parsnips. Oyster. I'm sorry. Taylor's corn. White corn. No, just take them down.
do the recording, then we'll flip the dogs. So I know that you wanted an opportunity to talk about some next steps and how we will use, you will use this information. So would you mind doing that while we collate this round of phrase story? Is that, is that okay? Thank you. And people can stay right at your table. There's one more very, after Dr. Carpenter speaks, there's one more very critical part that you need to participate in. So hang in there, and we will have you in the sunshine by the three. Um, first, uh, again, thank you for uh, giving up so much of your Saturday today, especially the students. Uh, Liam, I know that it is, uh, what, two days into the sixth season of Fortnite, and I'm sure that, you know, that's probably getting in the way of, uh, of your plans this afternoon, but, uh, but I, I appreciate the, the fact that, that you're here. Um, what we'll be doing uh, next over the next couple of weeks, I'll be reaching out to a subset of this group, and if you're interested, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, we would, uh, we'll be putting together a steering committee uh, that uh, ideally will have uh, a little over a dozen people who will spend a lot of time, and that's what I want to kind of emphasize, it's to go take all of this input and to draft it into what we want to do and where we want to see our school going over the next three or five years is going to take some time. And on my end, my hope is that we can take all this information and craft it together with the team uh, over the course of, uh, of October, maybe a couple weeks in November, and ideally before we head off to our Turkey and Thanksgiving uh, at the school committee meeting in my ideal world, uh, I'll be able to have this, uh, this steering committee bring a strategic plan to our school committee and say, here's the direction that we think uh, the Monterey Regional School should go for the, uh, you know, for the next three or five years. And, uh, and it's, it's nice to just hear, yeah, I, I, I think I'm kind of jealous that, uh, of, you know, I, I wish I could have been hearing all of the conversations happening at all the tables, but you know, it's nice to just at least get to uh, to meet and get to know at least the group that uh, that came by our table a little better and to hear those ideas. But I know that that was being replicated 12 times over um, this you know, this afternoon, so I appreciate that. Um, so I will. Uh, I, I don't know, if, Joy, you want to switch gears, and I could hand it off to you for a second, and I'll help Patty. Uh, so one of the things that we've done this year is. Uh, we have added what's called a community engagement coordinator to the school district. And uh, one of the ways that we were able to actually have this uh, take place today is with the support of Joy Jordan, who has worked actually in the background capacity for the school district, helping, uh, helping us develop our new website as a consultant over the last couple of years. It's been nice to actually hire Joy to help put together events like today, and as I was joking with Joy, today has been like um, planning a wedding for the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, but anyway, I just want to have Joy talk about opportunities that uh, that we have for you uh, to stay involved with us uh, beyond today. So I'm going to echo what Joy said. I just wanted to echo the thanks that everyone else has already given for sharing time, but your input and your ideas and your energy is really heartwarming to see so many people here that care so much about our schools. Um, I think when schools are involved in the community and the community is involved in the schools, it, it benefits everybody and everybody wins. I was thinking earlier this morning, exactly a week ago, I was here participating in the big fix, community cleanup, which I'm sure most of you have heard about, and there were probably about 20 students from Monway High School participating and a handful of teachers and staff. And the Friday before that, we had a middle school beach party that we launch every school year with. And at that event, the police and fire department had a man garbage team and for workers and dogs for the kids. And those are just a couple of the examples of the great vibrant things that can happen when the community is involved. So I want to encourage you, and I hope that this won't be the end of your involvement and your engagement, 
with our school. There are so many different ways to get involved. If you are part of an organization, you can think about ways you can collaborate. If you are a business, you can think about taking an intern from the high school program. Um, on an individual level, we are always looking for tutors at all the levels, for mentors. We're trying to launch, launch a mentorship program. So that's a great way if you're ready to commit to some time throughout the year. So just it's up there. take a moment to reflect and think about ways that you can use your own skills and talents to benefit the whole community and our schools. So thank you for being here. Oh. I just want to thank again on behalf of the field of my for all of us um, for your efforts in putting it together and, and, and to the district really to seeking our you know, uh, career opportunity um, you know, for, for people to be brought together and give them a nice lunch. Um, and and, and it has, you know, yep. that's what we make fun of. So I'm very grateful. Great. I'm so glad.
So it was the high frequency comments. Now I worry about that because I don't want the outlier creative thought to go by the wayside. Do know we have all the charts, we'll keep all the charts. But this was a way, in a very fast session, to get your collective energies. So there are charts, strengths, enhancements towards vision, obstacles, and improvements. And you take your blue dot, you go to the strength, and you identify the one greatest strength that you think is part of the community. We have all the charts, so we'll tie them all up, but what's the greatest strength that you see from the preponderance of data on the chart? Then you go to the next chart, to the next chart, and to the next chart. The dots are up here. There's a, a Q dot on one of the charts, so you'll know. And I think that's because we flipped the agenda, and you were supposed to do this before you heard from Dr. Carpenter and Joy, I think on behalf of my work, I just have to thank the commitment in this room, the energy in this room, the variety of people in this room, and uh, is overwhelming. It really is very cool on such a beautiful fall day to begin with. And to the students, my deepest respect for your attention and commitment today. Quite, quite so as someone who's dedicated 43, heading into 44 years of public education, I'm energized by today and I look forward to the next phase of this product for our locals. So thank you so much and have a wonderful day and a beautiful Sunday tomorrow. Don't forget.